So let's do this. Um, my name is uh, Nitan. There's no intro slide because everybody knows me. Um, I'm on Twitter and everything. Nobody knows me, actually. Who reads my blog? There's like three people, usually. One, two, probably three. Um, I have a blog. I do performance engineering for data stacks at the moment. I used to work for Azul Systems for a while. Um, I work on a few open source projects. Uh, some of you may or may not know. Um, it's what I do. Basically, I do a lot of um, profiling and performance work and write about that. Uh, so you can look me up online. I'm on Twitter and all that crap. Right. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, the other side of uh, GC. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about GC, but really about how you people create work for GC. So we're going to talk about allocations. We talk about how you observe them and what you can do about them and how they interact with the JVM. Okay, so GC is your friend. Um, it's sort of like your mother. You make garbage. It's not just like your mother, but my, in my case, it was my dad that was doing all the cleaning up. Um, you make garbage. You make lots of garbage. It's almost by definition, Java programs make lots of garbage. It's as if it's their only purpose. And then you never clean because that's the sort of bastard you are. And then the GC fixes it because it loves you. And it doesn't care that you're a bastard. It just, you know, cleans up after you. Now, that is an abusive relationship, and you guys need to think about, you know, what you're doing. That's not, no way to treat anybody. But anyway, right. Um, just generally, quickly uh, highlighting a few things about JVM memory and, and how it ends up playing out. Um, there's GC roots, which are threads and class loaders and static variables and all that good stuff. Um, and things point to each other. In this case, uh, we have an object on the stack. It points to something in the young heap. And other objects point to something in the old heap. Uh, some things are in uh, the young heap. Some things are in the old. There's an object graph of stuff that is alive. And there's a bunch of stuff that's dead. So this kind of scheme is generally um, referred to as genera generational GC. In generational, <laughs> sorry, I don't say that word a lot. Generational GC, uh, the good die young. And the assumption is that most allocations uh, don't stay around for very long. So you allocate some stuff that's related to the short-term work that you're going to do. And most of it goes away. And some state remains for later. And then all the GC has to do is mark the uh, live objects within the young gen. Um, and if there's a lot of stuff that's not marked, we can just throw them away. We can copy the live ones out, which is generally what the young GC does. Um, and we have a problem with that scheme where old generation objects might refer back to young generation objects. Now, the old gen might be massive. We don't want to mark the whole heap every time. Uh, we, we need to do a GC, so we have references back from old in a card table that is less granular than walking the whole thing. And they're marked as dirty when uh, this reference is back. So instead of walking the whole uh, old heap, we only have to scan the card table. And anything on the card table that is a reference from old back into young, we keep alive. Okay, That brings about a problem called nepotism, which I don't know if you guys know about, because very few people know about it. It's secret. Um, nepotism is when you have a reference from old to young. Um, the old object is dead, like a lot of old things. And even though it's dead, it's got a reference to young. Now, I haven't collected the old generation. I might not collect it for a while. I have a reference back to young. That means when I scan the card tables, I keep the young object alive. It keeps surviving, it comes into old, it brings all, all, all of its friends, and then we have problems. Um, this problem happens all the time. And usually it's not a huge issue. So it's, it's inevitable that some references back from old will survive. And I'm not recommending that you, you know, try and, and gnaw out all the references all the time. That would be stupid and you know, unhelpful. But um, 
if you're implementing any type of like linked list data structure or tree data structure where all the nodes are connected and then you throw away a node and it's still connected to all the nodes, then it's going to drag the whole tree into old every time. And that's a big problem for linked queues. It's a big problem for tree data structures. Uh, it's, it used to be a bug in the JDK. It got fixed. It used to be a bug in uh, JC tools. It got fixed. So it's a bug that keeps coming back. Just watch out for it if you're implementing that kind of data structure. OK, so young and die, cheap. If you live forever, then you stick around. And you increase the costs a little bit, but it's probably fine. Um, and the Middle Ages are the worst. The Middle Ages are the guys that stick around to be copied a few times. Maybe, maybe they make it into old, and then they die. So they pick up all the costs along the way and still have to be collected. Um, and they add to the old collection cost, and they add to the young collection cost, because the young collec collection cost is made of uh, you know, cleaning up and copying the uh, still alive objects. And copying is most of the cost. OK, so how do we know that GC is happening? Hopefully, um, we can do one of two things. We can plug in uh, some tool like JVisual VM. Uh, there's a Visual GC plugin. Who knows the Visual GC plugin? Good. Um, it's a really, really nice uh, intuitive view on, on the whole bucketing generational kind of flow. I really recommend it. It, it helps you understand how the, the garbage flows through the system. And uh, G1GC has a visualization that uh, Kirk Pepperdine came up with, which is really nice. Uh, he's got the project on GitHub, so if you look at on his uh, GitHub account, you'll find it. It's called Regions, and it visualizes the, um, the regions and their populations um, as an animation as your application progresses, which regions stay alive, which regions have uh, lots of data, which regions have humongous objects. Really very nice work. Uh, you can also observe with JSTAT, you can observe with JMX. There's a ton of monitoring tools that plug into JMX and show you nice graphs. So hopefully you have something along those lines and you've seen that uh, sawtooth pattern of build, 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 drop, build, 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 drop. Um, okay. The other side of this, again, everybody does it and everybody should do it if they're not doing it. Um, always have GC logging on. Always keep that and analyze it. There's a bunch of tools for doing it. Um, in particular, I use GC Easy most of the time. Sensum is very, very nice. Um, currently, it's commercial and paid, but if you ask them really nicely, they sometimes give you a license anyway. So try it out. OK, allocating baby objects. There's a really terrible terminology uh, thing happening with GC. So you're young, you're in the nursery, and then you tenure because you go from being a child to obviously being an academic. And then uh, tenuring, 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 and then you're old, and then you're garbage. <laughs> it's, a bit <laughs> it's a bit demeaning, I think. But anyway, OK, so where, where, do, uh, go, where does garbage come from? Um, we're not going to talk about the bees and the birds and people doing things to each other. Right. Uh, mutated threads or application threads, your Java threads, are the threads that generate the garbage, and they do that by allocation. So either they allocate with the new keyword, or they use uh, the magical syntax that secretly allocates. That usually comes in you know, a few flavors. I should have added lambdas here, actually. Uh, but you iterate over an array with the syntactic sugar, and it's an array list or a tree or some kind of collection, and you allocate the iterator. You might think that escape analysis always helps you out. Um, it doesn't always help you out. It helps you out sometimes. So that is a secret allocation that may or may not get eliminated. Um, and the other one is a var args kind of uh, method, which you know, it looks like you're passing in a bunch of primitives, perhaps, but actually you're allocating an object array, and it's all very ugly in the back end. Um, there's ways to deal with that. Hopefully, escape analysis helps. Usually, it doesn't uh, on, on the var args case. 
Okay, so what does allocation look like when it's happy? Because everybody looks better when they're happy. Um, right, we have thread local allocation buffers. Who heard about thread local allocation buffers? Okay, that's almost good. You're not doing very well, I have to say. Try a little bit better if you can. When you leave this talk, try better. Um, so, T labs are dynamically sized per thread. The, not all the threads have the same size T labs. Uh, the idea with T labs is that allocating from a local buffer that's only for your thread is cheaper than coordinating with all the other threads in order to take memory from some central pool. So, you uh, take a chunk, you allocate from that, and then you go back to the central pool for another chunk, but you only do that every once in a while, so there's less contention. It's a generally useful pattern, not only for the GC, but maybe for your applications as well. Um, so the fast and common path is, is very fast. Uh, you bump a pointer, you zero out the memory because you have to zero the memory because we're on the JVM, and then you're done. Everybody's happy. Sometimes, though, bad things happen. You run out of space in the TLAMP, and when that happens, you get a new TLAMP. Or you trigger a young GC, maybe. Or maybe you trigger a full GC, or maybe you run out of memory, um, and that's generally sad. You know what's also sad? Reading assembly is sad. Um, <laughs> so this is, this is uh, who knows the song, Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap? Lovely. Uh, excellent. Thank you very much. Don't sing it, but I appreciate the sentiment. Um, okay, so this is what the assembly looks like. Um, I can just stand here and give you five minutes to work through it if you want. Um, but the uh, really cool instruction in all this mess is the zeroing instruction down there. And you'll see that it's collecting most of the profile, even though the next instruction gets blamed for it. Not really important, just to, to show you that we're not talking about a lot of instructions. We're talking about, you know, a handful. Most of them are move, because we like to move it, move it on the JVM. And um, this is it. This is uh, an allocation. So, so what just happened? We spent 10, 15 instructions. Eh, not the end of the world. We did some zeroing. That's interesting. Uh, we probably had a cache miss, and probably from the last level cache. Who, by now, in their career, even though they haven't heard about T-Labs, realizes that CPUs have caches? Ah, oh, it's so good. Right, so quickly for the three of you who should be ashamed. Um, <laughs> Right, CPUs have caches, they have L1 caches, L2 caches, and so on. Generally what happens is that uh, L1 is small and fast, L2 is bigger, slightly slower, L3 is really big and somewhat slower, and RAM is you know, even slower, and going to another NUMA node is even slower. So to illustrate that, I drew you a picture. Um, that wasn't me, actually. This is uh, LS Topo. This is an i3. Uh, metal instance you can hire for a mere five dollars an hour to have the pleasure of play with it. Um, this is this is just um, a big picture with all the different caches. It's not very intuitive, so I made you another picture. Um, right, this is memory size proportional. Those like collections of red pixels. That's uh, that's the L, that's the L1 cache. The orange pixels. There are not that many of them, but there's more are the L2, green is L3, and the blue motherfuckers, uh, 256 of them on each side, are the big, big, big RAM. Um, so I think this, this perhaps more intuitively tells you that L1 caches are teeny, teeny, tiny. So no, nothing is going to fit in there. Nothing much is going to fit in there. Some people optimize to get the data structures in there. For most Java programs, that's not the case. Um, Conveniently, perhaps, you can fit a JVM inside the L3, and then you won't have any L3 misses, and then it'll turn out that I'm lying to you when I say that you will miss when you allocate. Most of the time, though, uh, I think the average heap size these days is something like one to four gigabytes. Um, and in that case, you're definitely falling out of the last level cache. 
And the nature of the game in, inside the JVM is that you know, I GC and then I, I give you the pages that I cleaned. So you're moving along and you're getting pages that were cleaned a while back. You haven't accessed them. They're probably not in the cache. So you're probably hitting main memory. Last level caches are far, far away. If we remember here, we don't need to remember actually because I have yet another picture for you. Um, I completely forgot about it. Uh, so this is the time proportions. So when you go to registers, it doesn't cost anything. Maybe it costs a little bit, but it doesn't cost much. Going to L1 is like one nanosecond, three nanoseconds to L2. And when we hit RAM, we're at 75 nanoseconds. So 75 times more expensive than just doing something locally. That's a dramatic difference. If you were reusing an object instead of allocating like a dirty bastard, then you wouldn't have this problem. Uh, but no, you have to allocate and then you get stuff from RAM. Um, how do we observe allocations? Again, we look at the GC logs, we can see uh, the allocation rate. Most tools uh, report that. So we have this nice number to start off with. Um, and then we can do allocation profiling. Who's done allocation profiling in the past? Okay, all right. Less people than the people who know about caches, but you know more than those who know about TLAMs. So somewhere in between. Uh, we have Java Mission Control and JFR. Um, it samples, which begs the question: samples how and samples samples how often? Um, an async profiler that samples the same. They both use a very similar mechanism. So you allocate, allocate, allocate. You run out of TLAB. You ask for a new one. When you ask for a new one, we take a sample. Um, that is good because it's sort of a natural sampling policy. And for most applications, it's just generally good and correct and fine. Uh, where it can be slightly confusing is that each thread has their own TLAM size. So different threads will be sampled at a slightly different frequency. And that can be very confusing, especially for very uh, low allocating kind of programs, um, in which case, perhaps consider using something like uh, JVisual VM. The overhead is going to be large, but uh, you'll just trap all the allocations and you won't have this problem. Um, however, you will see objects that used to escape as allocations. So, meh. win some, you lose some. Right. Quickly, we will do an allocation profile. Who, who's used async profiler? You all should use async profile. That's really awesome. Uh, and you can profile allocations with async profiler, which is actually not what I'll do, because that would take too long. But I'll just show you. Let's imagine for a second that we've defined all these aliases. Um, I want to call async profiler. I set it up up front, so it's not so dirty. I want to convert to flame graphs. I want to run this Java program that will do something funky. And then I want to find the, the PID for the process that I'm going to profile. So when I've done all that, things look a bit nicer. And I do something along those lines. Okay, I call async profiler. I give it the time I want to profile for, let's say 10 seconds. Uh, the format I want the output in, which is collapsed stacks. Who's heard about flame graphs? Okay. So. Um, We'll have a look at one just now. And then I want the event allocations. Uh, I want to sample the PID for my JMH benchmark. And I want to throw everything into that file. I'm not going to run it because I'm not going to run the benchmark. There's really no use. But I have this file. Nice. What does the file look like? Because nobody knows um, what flame graphs are. Let's start with that. So um, what we want to see is that there's a long, long line with all the stack. And at the end, we have a number. So this is, if you're used to seeing stack traces kind of as, a, you know, call, 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 and then lots of them, because you're calling JSTAC or whatever, or getting a stack traces in some other way, this is just, you know, taking it all in one line, putting semicolons in between. At the end, uh, we count the numbers that we've seen this stack trace. So here we're counting samples, of new TLAMP allocations, okay? 
And this will give this, us uh, an indication of where the allocations happened and how frequently. Cool. Right, now I take that and I shove it into the flame graph and I get an SVG, hopefully. Right, I get the previous SVG there. Right, this is what flame graphs look like. They look, uh, if you got one of these screens at home, they look gorgeous, uh, although the font isn't that readable. Uh, it's the price you pay, I guess. Uh, flame graphs are an interactive view on profiles that um, gives you a nice picture to look at, but also um, gives you a more intuitive way to look at um, a profile within a larger context. So if you're used to looking at the top methods that did something and then drilling down from those or using the tree view in your profile and click, 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 opening these massive trees, which you have to collapse because your application has deep stacks. Um, this is an alternative. Uh, the width of the frames tell you how frequent they are. And then when we get to the top, um, this is where the actual hotspots are. So in terms of your usual uh, profiling, the width, of the, the width of every frame is the total time except for the top ones where there's no curlies and then it's the self time because it's the same time. And what you're looking for when you're looking at this nice picture is these large plateaus on the top that indicate that this is a particular method that is a bottleneck for your application. So over here we have large uh, long array allocations and we can see at the bottom that we got them 46 times. You can also do nice things like search and so on. Now. Um, this is quite a large picture. It's not really that usable, even though arguably it's more usable than clicking through a tree. Uh, so maybe I don't want to look at it. The really, uh, in my mind, the really big win with the collapsed format is that it's a text file, and everybody knows how to manipulate text files. Um, some more than others. I'm probably less so than others. So uh, instead of remembering how to use awk and grip and all that crap, I put it in scripts so I can forget about it immediately. Um, so I have some scripts to do things like uh, count how many samples I have. So let's do that. Not that many samples, right? But that translates into this kind of crap. I wouldn't know off the top of my head how to do it. I had to look it up. But it's not, you know, it's a one-liner, and it sums up the number of samples. Um, and that, you might think to yourself, how attractive is that to look at a profiler inside your terminal instead of the nice flashy tool like, say, um, you know, IntelliJ or anything like that. It's less flashy. But... Having the file gives you the freedom to manipulate the file and search through the file, grip through the file, massage the file, whichever way you like. So instead of looking at a picture that is very complicated, you can customize it and make it your own. So um, what I've done is created a massaging program. No happy ending. Um, but fun, you know, and healthy. Um, and what is that? <laughs> okay. This is not the U.S. I can say whatever I like, right? It's not like the U.S. I'll get dragged off stage for doing anything like that. But here it's, it's Europe, you know. Everybody's into it here, I hear. I, I read up about it. Okay, so I took the big picture, and instead of looking at, a, at really, really deep stacks, I thought, okay, all the calls that are into Java Util, I don't care about Java Util, I want to collapse them all into uh, one frame that I can look at, and then, you know, the picture will be less complicated. All the calls into Nitty and its abstractions and its channels and all that crap, I don't want to know about it. I just want to see my stuff. So you reduce the complexity by doing some text processing. This is where having a simple, open format really becomes powerful. You can build your own tooling on top of it. And 
you know, generate clearer pictures and, and increase your understanding by doing it. So if you haven't heard of flame graphs and you've never looked at the uh, tool chain that comes with it, I really, really recommend it. In particular, the um, intermediate format, the collapse sex, opens up a lot of possibilities. Um, because if you want to do something like this with Java Mission Control, you are totally fucked. This is never going to happen. You're, even though it's open source now, you're not going to go into Java Mission Control and change the UI components to show you something that you couldn't see before. Maybe you would. I wouldn't, because it sounds very complicated and time-consuming. Doing some orc and grip shit, everybody can do that. And massaging a text file uh, in a program that's 100 lines long is really not beyond anybody. Um, even I can do it. Right. So uh, then we can look in here and see that this thread has allocated lots of shit. This is, uh, it's, it's not really important to, to analyze the profile. It's just that the, the tool chain is there, the tools are there. I recommend you use Asking Profiler and Flame Graphs and give them a go. Um, anything else? Right. Um, I you know, put together a stupid script to do the uh, top methods, if you like that sort of thing. So you can see the top allocators. And you can see the top allocators uh, with one level above them. Um, all of these scripts are kind of tiny, you know, one line orc things. Um, okay, maybe two lines. All right, it's not, nothing too complicated. Um, so, yeah, totally doable. Give it a go. Where were we? We're back here. Okay. So, tools list. I'll throw the slides online so you can look it all up. Uh, if you've never heard of grip, grip is your friend. Right. How to optimize allocations? It's really easy. Just don't allocate. We have 20 minutes for questions. <laughs> No, we don't. We don't. I usually run out of time. There's probably no time for questions. Just give up on that. Don't bother remembering anything you want to ask me. Um, what do we do to uh, reduce allocations? We replace an iterator with a counted loop. Am I saying you should do this everywhere? No, I'm not. I'm saying you should profile your allocations, and if you find an allocation hotspot that's a stupid iterator that the escape analysis did not get rid of for you, then you should introduce this. You shouldn't uglify your code in the expectation that something might happen to it, but if it can save you an allocation hotspot, eliminate the iterator, it's really simple. Uh, IntelliJ even has a refactoring for you to do it back and forth, so you can play with it to your heart's content. Uh, avoid vargs again in the hotspots in your code base. I'm going to repeat that until somebody understands it. Okay, avoid strings. Strings um, deserve their own like complete talk about the hell that people generate using strings. Uh, but generally speaking, strings generate tons of garbage. Uh, and if you have a uh, messaging protocol, I beg you not to implement it based on strings. Use something binary. Uh, but you know, beyond begging, if if you can avoid strings and uh, you can avoid string allocations, great. Um, implement using primitives, not the uh, boxed variations, where possible. Takes uh, a lot less space, and if you have uh, the opportunity to do that, that's great. Not always. Um, something that is kind of an API design problem. Uh, if you have a method that always returns a list so that your consumers can iterate over the list and do something, consider offering them the opportunity to pass the functionality to you and you'll scan the list with the functionality. Um, and that's a lot more likely to generate less garbage than the alternative. Um, if you have a special value, the classic example is returning a collections empty list. You know, you have sometimes you return an empty list, don't allocate an empty list for that. Just use the fixed value for empty lists. Um, and reduce copies. I know defensive copies are good, and I know that defensive programming is good, but why so defensive? You know, why not just trust your fellow man? 
uh, and maybe you know don't extend that trust too far but within your own application within your own code base where you can find people who violate their trust and take them outside and shoot them you know this this can work you can build a relationship okay um, if you can't avoid allocations altogether we can allocate less often um, we can do all sorts of things we can use a thread local buffer that we would uh, reuse again and again. This is a poor man's replacement for on-stack allocation usually. Uh, we allocate something and then we stash it in a thread local and then we reuse it again and again and again. If you look at code bases like uh, Netty, you'll find they even have their own special version of thread locals to make thread locals even faster because they lean on them a lot to do this. Um, Use some sort of object pooling. There's implemented object pools out there, so maybe use one of those. Uh, but sometimes it's a completely valid decision. Generally speaking, it might not be. So, again, start with profiling, find the hotspots, then apply an ugly solution. Don't start with the ugly solution everywhere. Um, lazy allocate is something that JDK does a lot. I recently realized that. Um, Perhaps I should have realized earlier. When you allocate a hash map and you say, I want the initial size to be 16, the hash map says, ah, you don't mean that. I know you people. You allocate all the time and you never put anything in. So there's an optimization there that uh, doesn't allocate the array, only allocates the array when you put something in. So uh, this, you have to imagine how popular this is to allocate maps and put nothing in them, to have made the JDK developers go out of their way and make the code more complicated just to optimize for this stupid case. So uh, we can do that, right? Uh, sometimes you have, let's say, a recent case I had, uh, there's a container for client warnings. Usually there are no warnings, but it was allocating the list upfront uh, to put the warnings that never came into it. You don't have to do that. You can allocate only on the special occasions that it's needed. Um, finally, you can do, um, you can go off heap. Going off heap is a very uh, exotic kind of option. It's not appropriate uh, and it's usually hugely expensive for many, many, many projects. But if you have um, some kind of large collection that would make sense to take off the heap and iterate over off the heap and you know, utilize that, it can work out. Uh, it's kind of a, an extreme solution. Um, I forgot to add that, so I'll just... Uh, there's no point here about this, but um, it's kind of like lazy allocation, but... Um, there's kind of a halfway house between the thread local and lazy allocation um, where you have a container that you keep around on the off chance that you would have to give it to someone. Now, that might be I, you know, a case I, I had to optimize away. Uh, we had a list of messages that we were going to send. Now, usually we sent them and everything was fine. But sometimes the send fails and you need all the messages to try and recover and la 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 la. So um, you have to have a list, you have to allocate it, and sometimes you have to give it to somebody else. So when that sometimes happens, allocate then. So it's kind of like, a, you know, allocate once, reuse, 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 and then detach when you have to detach and give it to someone. It's another option. Okay. Finally, after you've, you know, you can't avoid allocations, you just have to. Something to realize about objects is, uh, you know, objects in mirror are larger than they seem. The, um, the JDK has to allocate some frame for your object, and this translates into overheads. So, you need the object header, normally it's 12 bytes for everyone on 64-bit on JVMs and compressed oops, so probably most of you. Um, objects are always uh, eight byte aligned, and despite what some people may tell you, there is no guarantee what order your fields will be in, so don't count on that in any way, shape, or form. Um, but all the fields are always type aligned, and type aligned means that longs are eight byte aligned, 
and ints are four byte align, and chars are two byte align, and so on and so on, um, to, to avoid un unaligned access, and that's, and that's the way the JVM rolls. So, for example, with a Boolean, who should be one byte, you would think, you actually use up 16 bytes, which is non-trivial. You have 12 bytes for the header, you have one byte for the Boolean itself, and then, because you're not on a multiple of eight, you end up effectively using 16 bytes. So you went from one byte, 16 bytes, but only five fingers. So confusing, cognitive dissonance. OK, right. Um, let's take a slightly more complex but still quite idiotic example. Uh, I have two fields, right? 16 plus 4 plus 1. I just missed 16, now I have to allocate 24 bytes. The, it doesn't matter on, you know, when you allocate massive objects, but it's high overhead for tiny objects. And this is where the uh, theoretical rubber meets the road in the Java world. We in the Java world have idioms like, uh, don't inherit, use composition, right? Have small objects that have their own functionality and not so many fields. So we end up allocating trees of teeny, 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 teeny objects that refer to each other all the time. Um, that costs. All of these objects have relatively high overheads. So unless, so just for rough numbers, unless your object is more than 100 bytes, you have over 10% overhead of memory usage for each object, just as an idea. Um, you can observe your object layout and trees of objects layout with a project called JOL, Java Object Layout. It's yet another ship of production. Um, very nice tool. Uh, there's a command line variant. You can shove it into your tool and do that uh, in production if you like. But yeah, very useful for observing the object layout, um, not for everyday use. Use lubricants. Right, okay, if you're going to use that, JOL is rough on you, man. Okay, <laughs> okay, um, right, it's all the excitement it gets to me. Right, we want to implement a bitmap. We have lots of flags and we want to enable and disable them. We want to tell people what's happened, right? So let's say we have 64 or 128 flags. First thing we can do, have a Boolean array. The Boolean array would be four bytes, for the field that refers to the array, because we don't inline our friends in Java world, we refer to them. Okay, so we have a reference that's four bytes in my object that's referring to the array that has a 12 bytes header plus four bytes for the length plus 64 to 128 bytes. Overall, lots of bytes. If you've got a calculator, now's the time to use it. Okay. We can use Boolean fields inlined into our objects. We'll have like 128 teeny, teeny, tiny fields in our object, and that's going to be fine. That's going to use 64 to 128 bytes. Yeah. OK, it's better, but not that brilliant. We can use enumset. Enumset is actually quite clever. And enumset uses a bitmap, and that means it's much smaller than your previous solutions. So it's going to end up being 28 bytes for the um, for the 64 case, but if you you got to use more than 24, then you're going to end up with this kind of scheme, which will be more. I couldn't be bothered to calculate. Now, if you just allocate two long fields for the 128 case, or one long field for the uh, 64 bit um, or 64 flags, you can use bits as flags. It's old school, but it's so much more compact, right? Um, what's sometimes ridiculous is we get something, let's say, off the wire with flags that are an int, and then we convert them to one of these options because we're in Java world. So we take something that came in as eight uh, bytes and we explode it to however many hundreds of bytes to, to consume it. So. It's an option sometimes. Okay, that was optimizing the babies. Um, let's talk about the old heap a little bit. 
there's no way there's going to be time to for, for questions. Right, long live data. Presumably you know what you're doing and all the old data is necessary. Um, it's a big assumption, but I trust you. Uh, so you have uh, the thread and thread local data. Uh, you have some sort of global data and you have typically some pre-allocated pools and queues. Um, the more old generation you have, the bigger heap you're going to need, the more space uh, you're taking away from young. Um, you can do a hip dump to find out what's dominating your live set and use a tool like Matt. We're not going to go through that, but it has a dominators report. Again, optimize where it pays off, don't optimize everywhere. Um, the Middle Ages are terrible. If anybody read about the Middle Ages, it was a terrible time. And just like that, it's, um, it is in the JVM. So if young is too small, you'll have premature um, aging from young into survivors and then into old. So tune your GC. I'm not going to tell you how, uh, but there's lots of material about that. Okay, so that would lead to very rapid collections and everything would get collected too quickly. Sometimes you tuned your GC, but all of a sudden there's a burst of traffic and there's very high allocation rates, and then you do that. You try to avoid it, but it happens anyway. It happens. Um, this is the kind of legitimate cases of middle-aged objects. You can't totally avoid them, in my opinion, um, unless you take them off heap or recycle them. So you have caches. And in those caches, you purge out the old entries. Those old entries are old, so they've been there for a while. So maybe they got to the old generation, and now you purge them out, so you've aged them all the way. They cost you lots of effort. Um, similarly, uh, buffers. You have a buffer that you collect data, and you collect, 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 and then you flush. While you kept that data around, maybe it got matured into the old gen. So. Uh, and the, the last one is kind of collections or users or sessions that have kind of a longish lifespan and tend to make another part of this middle aging uh, population. To detect the uh, middle lifers, it's similar to how you would analyze the old heap. You basically take two uh, heap snapshots and then compare them over a period where these objects would have matured. Um, you can like if, if you're looking for the connections overheads and the kind of life cycle overheads, uh, connect to the system, run a workload, take a snapshot then, and then disconnect and see what's left after you clear everything. Um, again, use the same tool you used before to do your heap analysis, and that's going to be fun. OK. Quickly, another demo. Right. Who loves code? Code is great. Uh, this is the biggest code. Now, I'm going to show you a way to make your object smaller. There. <laughs> Everything is smaller. Great, right? Now, it doesn't, it works only on the Java level, but uh, the J Java C compiler doesn't translate it into bytecode, so it, well, the optimization goes away. Um, right, who can tell me how much memory does this benchmark produce? This, how much, who thinks it produces 100 megabytes per second? Who thinks it allocates nothing? Okay. Who's reluctant to speak when asked questions? Yes, okay, right. Um, I'm going to avoid the chicken joke that I've utilized before, but those of you who's watched it uh, will know which chicken I'm talking about. What's going to happen here, do you think? We have an array. We allocate it. Um, so just to recap for the reluctant answerers, uh, I'm going to ruin the surprise. You know what? Because nobody's answering. So when we allocate an object and it escapes, escape analysis works. And et voila, we're allocating nothing. Uh, by the way, I'm using JMH here. If you've never used JMH, give it a go. It's the way to go if you're going to benchmark anything. Um, however, as it turns out, uh, when I allocate an array, it doesn't work. So I have escape analysis messing up and not removing this array allocation. So this allocates a lot. It allocates the same as if I would be um, actually not escaping it. Not letting it escape, sorry. 
Hmm? That was a gasp of surprise, was it? Yeah. Make it louder. It's better. <gasps> yes. That's not my fault. Better? Okay. I'm so glad. Um, right. Okay. So we talked about the escaped array. We talked about the escaped object. We helped a member of the audience. It was beautiful. Right. Now we're going to have a look at uh, the other ones. So here we have the baseline zeroing and consuming. That's when you do a benchmark, it's good to have a baseline which demonstrates the costs of doing something similar. So I have an array, I'm zeroing it out, and then I'm returning it. I'm not allocating it every time. I'm just checking out, you know, okay, if I just zero and then I uh, put it away, what does that cost me? And I can run that. I can run it inside IntelliJ. And within six seconds or so, I will get, uh, it, it tells you how long it took, which is, was very, very quick, eight nanoseconds. Okay, filling up an array with 100 bytes is super quick. Awesome. How much is it when we allocate the young array? So we're only allocating young objects, all of them should die, right? Now, you know, even though zeroing apparently takes uh, eight microseconds, this takes double that. Sorry, eight nanoseconds. Um, and if I look at how much this uh, beast allocates, where is it? La, 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 la. Right, I wanted to run it with. Uh, <sighs> heavy breathing. Right, um, allocating nine gigabytes of memory, give or take. All right, the JVM, I think that's as much in my test, that's as much as the JVM can allocate uh, given this kind of simple use case on my machine, which is a beautiful machine. Right, how um, much. Is it going to hurt if I do something along this line? So I allocate it, and sometimes I shove it into some kind of live references array, and then things are going to survive. Okay, how much is that going to hurt me? I'm not going to run all the different options. Instead, we're going to use uh, whatever I. Yeah, lots of results. We only care about some of them, so. We're going to use our friend grip. Okay. Right. So the escape frequency is how often I let things escape and how often I keep them. Um, so if they, uh, sorry, how often I let them escape. Uh, and further, sorry, not let them escape, actually. So uh, in this case, one and two will end up in the live references. Here it'll be one and five, here it'll be one and ten, and so on and so forth. And we can see that um, if I'm, even if, you know, just one in a hundred escapes, I lose a third of the allocation rate. So I lose a third of my performance, even if just one in a hundred objects escapes to the, the survivor uh, camp. And then if we have uh, more, then we get more. So the, the, sorry, the, the more objects end up in surviving, the lower the allocation rate. So we go from uh, six, three, five, six, five, four, four, nine, and then four and a half. This is like half the allocation rate. It's not too bad, but it's you know, considering the simplicity of the use case, it might be or may not be surprising to any of you. Okay, um, so that was a brief aside. Um, we're going to skip this, actually. Oops, uh, let's just oops through it. Right, so what should you do when you leave the room? First of all, breathe a sigh of relief. And then um, you can go home 
And observe the allocation rate. Watch out for promotion rate. That's how much is surviving every iteration. And then profile allocations and try and find something that is meaningful to optimize. And when you do, try and uh, reduce your use, recycle when you can. And um, as a side note, if you eliminate indirection and minimize the footprint, the whole thing is going to hurt a lot less. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I made a promise on the talk um, description that people will leave the talk uh, slightly scented of lavender. I think that was a lie. I think I exaggerated somewhat. Uh, relaxed by invigor but invigorated, uh, I hope is true, and the, the cups of coffee are out there. Um, thank you very much. We have exactly zero seconds for questions, but uh, we can try anyway. Any questions? Hmm? Hmm? Hmm. What's DTNR Labs? Uh, that's the company through which I sell magic mushrooms and uh, other paraphernalia. Talk to me in the corridor. <laughs> It's, uh, it's an acronym for uh, Tink and Taylor Ninja Rockstar. There you go. Matt, yes, that's uh, another happy client. <laughs> Anybody has a serious question? I didn't think so. Uh, thank you very much.